very much to your colleagues, friends. Uh, this is for me a great honor to be here in Stanford, one of the world's best known universities and departments. So I'm deeply honored and grateful to provide this first Grand Valley Lecture of 2016. I wish everyone a happy new year, healthy and successful. As you mentioned, my name is Thomas Linder. I'm the chairman at the Kantonsspital of CERN, which is affiliated with the University of Zurich. I've been there now for 15 years. And I graduated in Zurich and was under my mentor and the leader, Professor Hugo Fisch, for many, many years. This brings me to the topic of the total peak sector. When we go back in history, in 1919, another famous apologist, Sir Charles Balance, first described that the middle ear cleft is a dangerous space if it is connecting to CSF. When Professor Fish, in 1966, visited, uh, well, far from here, Los Angeles, the housing moment, at that time, taking out acoustic neuromas or vestibular had the difficulty of CSF leaks and patients may, may have developed meningitis after acoustic neuroma surgery. So when Professor Fish went back to Zurich and developed the lateral skull base approaches, the main issue was how to prevent CSF leaks and how to avoid meningitis. This is why he came up in 1967 with the introduction of the subtotal petrosectomy, which is the first chapter of the microsurgery of the skull base book, our Bible that we have in lateral skull base surgery. Now, how does subtotal petrosectomy fit into ear surgery? When we speak about ear surgery, we, or I make a distinction between three different types of ear surgery. There is the autologic surgeon. He does mainly middle ear surgery. Cycloplasties, open cavities, closed cavities. He's very meticulous, extremely precise. He takes his time to place that prosthesis correctly into the middle ear to get the best result. Then there is the temporal bone surgeon, who is the drill guy. Uh, he's the one coming in and uh, doing a lot of drilling in the temple bone. He goes beyond the mastoid cavity into the preacher's apex. And his workhorse is the subtotal preacher's segment. And then there is the lateral skull base surgeons who now go beyond the preacher's apex uh, into the <coughs> infratemporal fossa, taking out tumors in the infratemporal fossa, reaching the nasopharynx from the lateral side and from our colleagues from rhinology who come from anteriorly and reach the ear from the ear nose. Also, lateral skull base surgery is trans or translab approaches and middle cranial fossa approach. And the subtotal petrosectomy is really here the workhorse for the temporal bone and lateral skull base surgery. What is it? We can define it as the complete accentuation of almost all pneumatic cell tracts of the temporal bone. <coughs> when I say almost, what are the cell tracts that you do not reach if you need to see here the schematic drawing after subtotal petri segment? Which cell tracts are still left in place? And our colleagues, the petrus apex. Huh? You still may have a pneumatized petrus apex. So in order to reach the petrous apex, you have an important structure right in front of you, which is the inner ear. So we divide the subtotal petrosectomy into an SP with or without removal of the upper capsule, depending on where you want to reach into the temporal bone. You can perform a subtotal petrosectomy as an isolated procedure, so you write down on the operating note, I performed subtotal petrosectomy with or without removal of the optic capsule. It's always a part of the transotic approach to the internal auditory canal. I know that we are one of the very few centers still doing transotic approaches. Most centers do the translab approach, but uh, we 
enjoy the transoptic approach to total peak resectomy, and we'll very briefly come to that. And so total peak resectomy is the heart or the core of the lateral skull base approaches A, B, and C. If we look at these three approaches, an A approach is <laughs> intended for jugular foramen tumors. I was listening to your previous lecture, and we uh, you talked about the lower cranial nerves and where they come out. So uh, they come out here at the jugular foramen, ars nervosa, and if you want to reach the jugular foramen mainly for paradomyomas or schwannomas, then the subtotal peak resectomy with rerouting of the facial nerve anteriorly provides you the space to reach safely the jugular foramen. The type B approach is an approach which is aimed to reach the petrous apex. You open the temporal mandibular <coughs> joint, you follow the carotid artery into the horizontal portion, but it's also based on the subtotal petrous segment. Finally, the type C approach, going along the skull base and reaching the nasopharynx, is mainly nowadays used for persistent nasopharyngeal carcinomas after irradiation. But it's also based on the pseudo-peak Now, it's actually not much more than an open cavity. Because if you look at an open cavity, here the CT scan of an open cavity postoperatively, and we look what cells we drill out in an open the total peak resectomy is an open cavity procedure, drilling away all these cells here, and in addition to take away the drum, the ossicles, and the middle mucosa. So it's not a big deal to do a subtotal peak resectomy if you're familiar with an open cavity procedure. What's left at the end is almost the same, uh, except the middle ear part, and then it's obliterated with <coughs> fat and the muscle at the outer side. The concept of the subtotal petrosectomy is to separate the potentially dangerous spaces, the outside, from the inside. And there are only two access routes to the <coughs> temporal bone. One is the external ear canal. So the external ear canal is closed in two layers. And now I hear at meetings that people start to do just to close the skin. I don't think that is enough. We have a double layer closure skin and periosteal flap to have what we call a watertight closure. Watertight means water from the outside. These patients want to go swimming and spend hours in uh, crawling through the uh, lakes. And watertight means if you have CSF coming from the inside, it should not pour through the external ear canal. So we strongly advise to stay with a double layer closure of the external ear canal. And the second entrance route is, of course, the station tube. Now, with the subtotal petrosectomy, we see the station tube. We see the isthmus of the station tube. So we can tightly close this area to make sure that there's no way of an ascending infection or of a descending CSF leak and a binary career. Second is, when we close the external ear canal here in the lateral part of the ear canal, of course, we have to be sure that we remove the medial skin, otherwise we'll reduce the cholecytoma, as well as the entire membrane, <coughs> including the ossicles. And the question is always, should you also remove the stapes, yes or no? If you have no disease on the stapes, you can keep the stapes. If you have diseased mucosa on the foot plate, you may need to remove the stapes superstructure and clean carefully the area on the stapes foot plate. Strong ear canal skin, the medial skin, tympanic membrane in one piece. You want to take it out in one piece to be sure you're not leaving that kind of skin. And milieu ossicles, yes or no. And then comes the drilling part, and that's what we enjoy. And the drilling means taking out all these cells the retrosigmoid air cells, the retro or labyrinthine air cells, sinusoidal angle, retrofacial cells. Skeletonizing the facial nerve from the stylomastoid foramen, from the mismastoid portion, the tympanic portion, to the genicular ganglia, drilling away the supralabyrinthine space here, bordered by the ampulla of the superior canal, lateral canal, facial nerve, and dura of the neurocranial fossa. 
super tubal cells, then skeletonizing the jugular ball in the hypotympanum, finding the carotid artery in its vertical portion here, and drilling the pericarotid cells until you reach the isthmus of the station tube. Yes, it's a lot of drilling, but again, that's what we're here for. We're the drill guys. And finally, when you have closed the station tube, taking out all the mucosa that you could reach, we will obliterate the cavity with abdominal fat and, in addition, the temporalis muscle fat covering and keeping the fat in place. Again, others uh, now claim that you don't need to cover that with muscle. We've always <coughs> done it this way. We were happy with it. Never change a winning horse. Mm. Maybe you won't need that muscle exactly, but uh, I will show you we'll still use the muscle as a second layer closure of the fat. So the muscle temporalis muscle is brought over the cavity and secures the fat in place. And on a CT scan, you can even distinguish between the fat part and the muscle at the outside. Now there are two ways for skin incisions. If you look in the skull base book by Professor Fish, you will find the S-type incision. And it, this was for many, many years actually the workhorse. So we make a retoric incision right here, as the tip, an S-shaped incision, and the upper part of the S is only there at the end of the procedure to be able to rotate the temporal muscle. So we start only with like a regular retoric approach, and at the end of the procedure, we expand here superiorly, and we raise the muscle, and we rotate the muscle over the subtotal. The advantage is you have a big bulk of muscle to cover your defect. The disadvantage is the bulk is missing here, so you may have, if you have a bold gentleman or someone with not a lot of hair, you see the contour is now different because the temporalis muscle is missing here, which may cosmetically be a problem. Second is, if you don't cut out here a small triangle, you will have too much muscle bulk, just where the pinna attaches, and the ear could be pushed forward, which looks really not nice. So taking this uh, in account, make sure that you cut out a small triangle here in order not to have a funny looking pinna. But you can do exactly the same procedure with an L-shaped incision, especially if there was no previous surgery. If you have intact soft tissue. We nowadays favor a small L-type incision, retroricular, and then slightly extending posterior. It's also a right ear. Then we will lift our muscle periosteal flap. We have made here the periosteal flap for the closure of the external ear canal as a second layer. Then we raise the muscle here superiorly. See, this would be the excision of uh, the elevation of the periosteal flap. You can do all your mastered work here. At the end of the procedure, you re-suture your muscle. But of course, here now, there's a little bit of periosteum missing because you used it for the double layer closure. And what I do, I just harvest a little bit of fascia from the temporalis muscle. And as a free fascia graft, I just suture it in place so that the fat will not pop up. So with this incision, you have no troubles with cosmesis and you have a faster wound healing and less pain in the immediate post-op period. I looked uh, the last few years when I was in Lucerne, or started in Lucerne, from, that, from our 80 subtotal petrosectomy, still the majority were the S-type incisions. Before we started more and more using the L-type, the other reason is that the majority is revision surgeries. So if you have previous surgeries, you may not have enough tissue to cover your fat. So then I would still go for the temporalis muscle, because usually it's not damaged. Uh, even if someone has good fascia, that's not an issue. But in revision cases, I, fa I still favor the S type of incision. We will come to the combination with these parts. So what is the best indication for a Sure, you'll find it next week in your outpatient study. <coughs> the best indication are patients with a dead ear, no hearing, 
and still they're draining you. They usually have multiple surgeries performed. They still have an oozing ear. They will be seen by doctors every month to clean the ear. It's a dead ear, but they clean the ear. They, they uh, don't like it because it's painful. But this is a situation like this. This is an ideal case to close the ear, get rid of the infection. After four weeks, the patient can go swimming without any protection. Swimming, doctor? I've never told to be swimming because of a draining ear. Yes, you can go back swimming because you don't need to care. I need to see my doctor on a regular basis. No, you don't need to see your doctor anymore. So patients are extremely happy. They usually have a long-standing history of ear drainage, but they have a dead ear for whatever reasons. I put up some reasons here, but uh, it's just the message is dead ear, draining ear. You close the ear and the patient then is going to be happy. Transverse temporal bone fractures. Late in the evening. What is the problem of a transverse temporal bone fracture? So the facial nerve, <clears throat> what is the risk of, uh, for the facial nerve? That you have a traumatic yeah, facial palsy. Right, bony chips. If you compare longitudinal fractures and transverse fractures, what is the difference in respect to a facial nerve injury? Two differences. One is the site, and one is the depth of an injury. So in longitudinal fractures, you expect the lesion site, the nickel ganglion, because there are three vectors, there's blood vessels from the greater superficial petrosal nerve, so the fracture goes into this area, it starts to bleed, so they usually have what kind of facial palsy? Yes, a delayed facial palsy. Longitudinal fractures, delayed geniculate ganglion. Transverse fractures, what is the lesion site for the facial nerve? What is here? <laughs> it goes through the optic capsule. Tympanic sac. So the most common lesion is tympanic sac, not the geniculate ganglion. Tympanic sac. What is the Immediate delayed unknown. Unknown is when it's intubated, we don't know. So it's usually immediate. Because for a transverse fracture, that's a big trauma to the temporal bone. And this is the hardest bone uh, in the body. So if this fracture, there must be a, a lot of force. So in transverse fractures, you can expect the lesion of the facial nerve in the tympanic sac. It's usually an immediate facial palsy. And in 50%, the nerve is. So the lesion is not just the edema that you mentioned in body junior fractures, it's cutting, it's stretching, <coughs> it's two-thirds of the nerve is gone in transverse temporal bone fracture. So that's problem number one, or one of the problems. The second problem, what happens to the fracture over time? So you see two, five years later, ten years later, counseling. Is that true? Yes, it's probably not true. <laughs> no, it's not. Because the anticapsula is in chondrolosification, it has no chance for calcification. We get the calcification in the inner ear, meningitis, labyrinthitis, labyrinthitis ossificans, but the fracture line will not calcify. So it will stay open. Which means, coming back to Sir Charles' balance, if this patient with a transverse fracture will get later an otitis media, he has a direct route from the middle ear to the CFS. So these are the patients which are at risk for late meningitis. They had a trauma maybe in childhood, and many years later they suddenly have a meningitis. Oh, where is the meningitis coming from? <coughs> Oh, he's not hearing well on one side. That's deaf ear. That one. Oh, he was dropping from the floor. From the floor. This is the reason. In transverse fracture. So in transverse fractures with facial pulses, the best approach is the subcotal petrosectomy because you reach the tympanic segment right away, and at the same time you avoid the problem of late meningitis. Maybe you 
tired already, but the patient still has an open fracture, and he will have many So this is for us a very good indication. Facial nerve paralysis in transverse fractures to do the subdotal producer. The ear is gone. It's a dead ear by definition. Next is in cholecystoma surgery. What is strange here? What is Talking about cholecystoma, well, there's a little bit of mass here around the ossicles, but where is the lesion? Yeah, here, huh? Right? the capsule, and there's something strange here, like a worm, huh? So there's something in the petrous apex, Not good. which, of course, from CT we cannot say it's cholecystoma, but it has the typical appearance of an apical or so called supralabyrinthine cholecystoma. They usually present with a slowly progressive facial pulse. These are the patients who are treated by neurologists for Bell's palsy. Mm -hmm. And they recur. A few months later, again, Bell's palsy. Oh, second Bell's palsy. Third Bell's palsy. No, it's not possible. You don't get three times Bell's palsy. So you look for another pathology, and you may find a facial nerve schwannoma or a supralabyrinthine cholecystoma. Very typical, slowly progressive facial palsy. And you see here, if you look at the CT scan, it's really difficult to distinguish what is the capsula, what is this, the destruction going on. So it's a weird CT scan in the Peter's apex. And we spoke in the beginning that if you want to reach this area, you have to go and take the copia away. So this would be the subtotal picrosectomy with removal of the cochlear capsule. Cochlear implant surgeries. If you want to implant this patient, chronically grainy ear. And you place 30,000 Swiss francs in a chronically grainy ear. <laughs> I, never <understood. laughs> I never understood the concept that people will do a, a, an open cavity ear and then cartilage and then they place the reconstruction underneath the cartilage and electrode cable. No. What you do is, in chronic draining years, so you need a cochlear implant, you make pseudo second. Only question is, can you do it at the same time? Because this is a chronically infected ear. So when you've done all your drilling, everything looks clean. Do you place the implant now, 1,000 first francs? Or do you say that's too dangerous? There couldn't be one or two bacteria sitting there, and you stage it. I'm more in favor of primary implantation. In all my cases I've done right away. I've never had Schwartz an infection so far. So I usually do it in one stage because at the end of the surgery it looks so clean. If it's the only <laughs> indication which I would not do is in irradiated bones. If you have a nasopharyngeal carcinoma patient, irradiated death needs a cochlear implant. <laughs> chronically draining ear, secretions, necrotic bone. No, you would not place that implant into that necrotic bone right away. You wait six months, come back, and then implant into this sterile cavity. Malformations, I will briefly talk on that. In, as we said, transverse temporal bone fractures, when they need a cochlear implant. And if you need to do a drill out in obliterated cochleas, because to do a drill out and the, and the carotid being very close, it's nice to open up the surgical field and to do the drill out procedure there. My experience, however, is that these are usually poor performance. So if you have an obliterated cochlea and you do a drill out, yes, technically <coughs> you can place the electrode there, but functionally, they're usually not good. Outcomes. If you remember one thing from my lecture, it is <laughs> this slide. Let me give you the brief history. This, at that time, was a 17-year-old Greek gentleman who had a history of bilateral tuberculosis of his ear, and he deafened due to the tuberculosis. He had wealthy parents who sent him to a very famous institute in Europe. And the surgeon did a cochlear implant procedure. The 
implanted. He had difficulties at implantation. And he wrote in his operating note, I had to do a drill out of the cochlea to be able to place at least half of the electrodes in the cochlea. The patient was then fitted in that institution, but for one year, he didn't have any benefit. Because he was only seen by the audiologist. One year, nothing, no sensation, so he came to see us. Now, message number one is, if you have a patient with one year of rehab without any result, what would you do? <laughs> Some sort of x-ray, huh? Where is that electrode, huh? Yeah. So, we did an x-ray, and we did a CT scan. Now, what? Can you read from that CT scan? What is the difficulty? The patient is now one year after the implantation, there's no hearing at all. Why? Why was he lucky also? When we look at the axial CT scan, <laughs> We see that the surgeon went here through huh? the electrode cable and the ended close to what is this structure here? Carotid arc. So the patient was lucky that the surgeon, an experienced surgeon, stopped his drilling procedure before the carotid artery was hit. And where is the electrode? Because he described that the cochlea was obliterated, so he had to drill. Look at the end. Ronal CT scan, the electrode cable is in the cochlea. Not really, yeah? So it's below the cochlea in the hypotympanum. Now comes my message. Why did, and a famous center with an experienced surgeon, why did this happen? What was the bad thinking, the bad planning? Just look at these scans and assume the electrode cable is not there. Because I'm sure the CT prior to surgery looked exactly the same, just without the electrode. Then what is the problem then? You find the surgery and that's the patient. History of tuberculosis. And no landmarks. There's no air in the middle here. This is just filled with soft tissue. This is a rather sclerotic mastoid. So going through a mastoidectomy, posterior tympanotomy, reaching into a middle ear space which is very shallow and completely scarred by tuberculosis, how can you find the cochlea? I can't. So the decision to go through the standard approach was wrong. If you read the CT scan correctly, you say, that's not a patient for a posterior tamponotomy. That's a patient where I need maximum exposure. I need to find that cochlea. What is a maximum exposure? It's the supposed tetracycline. So this is the view at revision surgery. I just placed this. This would be what the view was of the primary surgeon. And this would be the ear canal. This is the mastoidectomy. It's bleeding, of course. And he went <coughs> somewhere here through the posterior tamponotomy. Now he had no vision at all because it's all dark and black and bleeding. And he went here through and placed the electrodes close to the carotid. But if you do, this is now the beginning of the subtotal petrosectomy. That's the same patient at the end of subtotal petrosectomy. I mean, everything is great. This is the cochlear here. This is the right window. You can easily insert the properly placed cochlear implant. You have solved all the problems of exposure by doing a little more drilling, but I'm sure the surgery didn't take longer than <coughs> this surgery, which was difficult to start. So at the end, the subtotal petrosectomy helped in clearing that problem. This is the post-operative picture with the standard X-ray, just to confirm the proper placement of the implant. But the message is in the planning of such a device, it's always in surgery exposure, exposure, exposure. So you do the best to get the best exposure. 
in temple bone malformations. This patient needed a cochlear implant, very low hanging dura. Or this patient, we had a very similar case today. Huh? The sigmoid sign is being very close here. I mean, you can never do a post nothing here. So the subtotal Peter said to me, it's not much more than canal plasty. <laughs> the canal plasty, you see here nicely the, the obliteration of the station tube. And here, at that time, we did cochleostomies. Now that we go to the round window, this is the sigmoid that you can see here. So yes, it is a subtotal Peter sectomy because you do all the steps that yeah, is required, but it's not much more than a canal plus the electrode into that cavity. Inner ear malformations. <coughs> what is the difficulty in whatever you talk about inner ear malformations? Of course, length of electrodes, what type of implant you want to choose. But as a surgeon in the planning, what is your concern? any sort of inner ear malformations. Gushing, right. CSF leaks. Right. Even a large lucidal aqueduct, they can do a heavy CSF leak. So when I'm usually at meetings and people know what I'm talking about, and I hear that my friend next to me says, you know, if I have that problem, it's very easy. I just um, have to head up a little bit. I Go out to the operating theater, drink a cup of coffee, wait 10 minutes, and when I come back, the gusher is gone. And then I insert the electrode, I plug with fat. Some have even developed a special electrode cable to plug your cochlear system. I would not feel safe going to having a cup of coffee and waiting until CSF stopped, coming back, placing an electrode, suturing back the wound. The anesthetist roughly extubates and the <coughs> patient starts to cough, and CSF is back. So if I have a gusher in an inner ear malformation, Mondini or other types, I do a subdote picture study. Small children, one year old, older children, adults, you name it. I don't take the risk of having a CSF where you can just be plucked with a little bit of know that this is more work, it's two hours more surgery, but at the end I'm safe that this patient will never have a meningitis from that ear. Maybe from the other side, because it's usually bilateral. Huh? But from that side, I can be sure he will not have meningitis. And we have seen cases who had implants, or who developed meningitis later on. Now the implant is in place, he's probably quite a good candidate, but he gets repeated spells of meningitis because he has CFSF leaks. Now you have a problem. You have to take out the implant to the subtotal. That's now it's a difficulty. So start beforehand in the planning that if you have a gusher, you just do subtotal percent. It's the same skin incision. It's nothing more than yes, you have to harvest fat. So you have to inform the patient before that you need some fat. So CSF leak in heavy gusher. Other CSF leaks, we see patients usually after trauma or gunshot wounds. You see much more than we do in Switzerland. We see one gunshot wound in five years, probably. <laughs> and then everyone's you know, all excited. <laughs> so, everyone has a gun. Many, <laughs> everyone has a gun, that's right. We were talking about this this morning. I have a gun at home myself from military service. I don't remember how to use it. <laughs> and so if you have CSF leaks, and these are usually patients treated by neurosurgeons. They have first revision, second revision, still oozing from somewhere in the temporal bone, a crushed temporal bone. Oftentimes they also have a conductive hearing loss, complete conductive hearing loss, so they're not worried about hearing. So you close that ear, you do a subtotal Peter set. It's fine, even if you're still having CSF in your cavity but it's not draining out, and it's no meningitis. In tumor surgery, in small size, the type B paragoniomas, these are the ones sitting on the jugular bulb. They're small, and for me, I don't like them. Because they're too small to do a big approach, and <laughs> they're too big to do a small approach. So here, it's always should I keep the hearing or not? But um, you may do the subtotal petrosectomy for type B paragonomas without removal. 
In malignant tumors of the external uh, ear canal and middle ear, you combine the radical resection uh, with the cephalopatrocectomy, ablation of the ear, neck dissection. So it's a part of your procedure in the uh, cancer of the temple bone, but you're very familiar with that. Now let's come to here. <coughs> You have two types of patients. One is the patient we discussed from the beginning, the dead ear. The other patients may have inner ear function left. So we have two groups of patients to address now hearing rehabilitation. If you have a patient with a dead ear, or he may get a cochlear implant. Nowadays, as you know, in Germany, if you have single-sided deafness, they all get cochlear implants for single-sided deafness. Uh, not in Switzerland, because it's not reimbursed. I'd love to do it, but it's not paid. So the cochlear implant is certainly an option if you have a dead ear and you do a supposed petrocephaly. What other options do we have? Yes, but you know we have the ear canal is closed. Yes, you can fit a cross hearing aid, but it's usually patients don't want it. But the best option is the bar. Because you do the same as with the cross control after working off the signal, so you place a baja with your petrosectomy and it goes to the other side. So baja is certainly an option in these patients. Let's go to this patient population which retained inner ear function. What options do we have here? Closed ear, we cannot fit in with the conventional hearing. That's not going to work. Baha should be super. Baha, of course, again, Baha. It's now ipsy and contralateral routing of signal. So now we're going on both inner ears. Huh? So Baha is certainly an option, and all types of Bahas, if it's Baha attract or connect or Baticum, uh, just make brackets Baha. Other option? The inner ear is still working. What implant? Yes. What sort of implant? Yes. Cochlear implantation. Cochlear implant with a normal hearing inner ear. So because the inner ear, see, bone conduction is normal. Huh? And middle ear implant. So you can fit the active middle ear implant vibrant sound bridge. You just have to couple it to the inner ear. And there are two ways to couple it. One is on the stick bits. But if you have removed the stapy superstructure because of disease, you cannot place it well on the foot plate. It will not stay there. And the other option is the round window placement. So you place this small FMT floating mass transducer. You place it onto the round window, and it will import the <coughs> audiological signal as a mechanical vibration on the round window membrane. We've started with total petrosectomy and round window vibroplasty almost at the same time that Poletti described his round window approach, and we published that, and the results are excellent because you have no more airspace. Everything vibrates. The fat around it, the bone on it, so the functional gain that you get with the subtotal petrosectomy and round window ideal for sound transmission. You just need to expand a little bit the round window niche because the floating mass transducer is slightly larger than a normal round window. It's like a cochlear implant, so you need to see the round window in front of you. Then you can tightly snuggle in that FMT into the round window niche. So the round window vibroplasty in combination with the subtotal if inner ear function is preserved. Also published our the first results, long-term results, long-term five years, up to five years, and we have seen that these FMTs they <coughs> stay in place. They don't move out. So 
up to now, I'm touching wood, we do not have a patient who lost his FMT out of the round of toe, but they all stay So for hearing rehabilitation, the F, the active middle implant, has brought in a new solution in patients with retained inner ear function by coupling it either to the round window. There are also nowadays round window couplers. Not too f much fun of this one. I try to place it without the coupler. Or you can place it with this coupler on the stapes in cases that you have preserved stapes. And this is probably a very good adaptation onto the stapes and then to the ear. And we can say that radiologically from our study, audiologically, and from the patient satisfaction, that's a very nice. What is the follow-up after subtotal peak resectomy, at either with or without implant? At one year, we always do a CT scan. The CT scan, I want to know, is the obliteration of the station tube high to nine? Mm -hmm. We do have very few failures. Mm -hmm. I could have an air bubble here. Huh? You say, oh, I didn't correct it. Close at the station tube. I would not revise. I would just tell the patient it's not completely sealed. So if you get a stuffy nose and pain towards the ear, please see your doctor and get immediate antibiotics because the fat will just fade away if you have an infection in that way. So I do a CT scan at one year, but luckily in 95% of all our subtotal pigments are like this, so they're closed. No air. It's water air type. And then if you have, of course, cholesteatomas as primary uh, etiologies, we do then follow up with MR, with non-EPI diffusion <coughs> MR. Previously, we couldn't do it in the vibrant sound bridge patients because we couldn't do an MR in the vibrant sound bridge. But with the new device of the vibrant sound bridge, this is MR compatible. So nowadays, we can safely place a vibrant sound bridge on the ossicles, on the stapes, or on the round window, and still perform MRI to exclude the residual, well, the current, to exclude a residual cholesterol. So to summarize my lecture, I think that the subtotal petrosectomy offers the maximum exposure to the temporal bone. If you're limited and you need more exposure, go to the subtotal petrosectomy. It prevents ascending infections, CSF leaks, meningitis. Here. And I think it's one of the most beautiful surgeries in the temple <laughs> because you see it all, all these nice structures that we have in the temple. And at the end, I would like to show a video. It takes too long, so I will ru run a little bit through the video um, to show you the and I'm very happy to take any questions. So this was an 11-year-old uh, patient with an uh, apical cholecytoma. Here you see the cholecytoma, similar to the other patient that showed you in my uh, previous slide. Here, we don't know yet if this is cholecytoma, I'll show you the MR, it is cholecytoma, and it has destroyed the superior canal and the lateral canal. Huh? She still has inner ear function left, but by taking out the cholecytoma, this will be gone. So the two canals are open. So the dis discussion was, should we do a combined approach, middle fossa and lateral approach? Well, if you lose hearing anyhow, well, I wouldn't do it. So we choose for the support. Right here, S type incision. Nowadays, I would use an L type incision because this was primary surgery. You make a periosteal flap as a second layer closure. Transect the ear canal first, only the posterior half. Then you identify the cartilage of the tragus anteriorly. You slide a clamp anterior to the tragal cartilage, and then you transect the ear canal completely. You divert the ear canal towards the surgeon, 
Then you have to have one centimeter of skin sleeve, which you dissect carefully. There's two stay sutures. You bring out the skin through the ear canal opening. You see that short, so you bring out stay sutures, one inferiorly, one superiorly. Bring it out, and now you can evert the skin and close the skin as a first layer. Pull it out gently. There's always a little too much skin posteriorly. You can trim it so it's both sides the same level. And then with vitral sutures, we like to use vitral, which we take out at four weeks. It would resorb also, but uh, we take it out at four weeks. And this will be the first layer, and then the second layer is then the periosteal flap. So we push that back in. It looks like a normal ear canal. So from the outside, it's a normal ear canal. The periosteal flap is sutured to the cartilage rim. Then we cut out the lateral sleeve of skin. We still have the drum. We start with the mastoidectomy, wide removal of bone. By removal of bone, we start seeing the <coughs> iceberg tip of the cholecytoma, so that's the smallest part of the cholecytoma. The major part is more meat. Then we start to find the sigmoid sinus, skeletonize the sigmoid, do an inferior canal plasty, find the drum, the annulus, the corda is transected. This rarely it's possible to preserve the corda. Most of the time you need to resect. Then take out the tympanic membrane with the malleus attached to it in one piece. This is important not to leave back any skin in the cavity. So we have to see what we're doing. We do a further <coughs> drilling of the inferior canal wall, and then we can take out the drum with the malleus. <coughs> Separated the inclinolia joint, probably the colostoma has that work already. And bring out this eardrum. <laughs> yes, fish sure. microaspirator, yeah. exactly. <laughs> My preferred <laughs> instrument. I love that. Yes, absolutely. And now we start to see the colocytoma. Somewhere here are the, is the labyrinth. We don't know exactly where to start, but we'll find it. So, skeletonization of the dura of the middle fossa, skeletonization of the sigmoid sinus. Here is the stylomastic frame, the gastric ridge has been skeletonized. Now we lower to the level of the facial nerve. This is the cord here running through. We lower until we see the facial nerve shining through the bone. That's the skeletonization, seeing the structure underneath the last shelf of bone. And we are now approach our unknown area from the known side. Find the facial nerve, you know, we found it here. We know where it's in the tympanic segment, so we, I like to use cotton in the dissection of colocytoma matrix. The cotton is at the tip of a suction. It's just easier to stimulate it away. So we find the facial nerve here. We have the facial nerve here, and now we start to do the labyrinthectomy, following the dura of the middle fossa, then seeing the lateral canal here is, was opened in part by the colocytoma, in part of course, now the surgery. Pull off the lateral canal. Lateral canal is open, but there will still be more cholestatoma behind. Here first, I tried to seal that off. Mm. Of course, it didn't help. Here's that. Mm. Then we come towards the familiar space. This is part of the cholestatoma, still in here. So we're, we have now removed this part of the cholestatoma, and we're now aiming at the cholestatoma part. This is still in the middle ear, so this will be hypertympanum, carotid artery. We will need to see the carotid later on. Hmm. Find the planes, the station foot plates. The station tube, this is going to be the station tube, but still a lot of mucosa. All this has to be cleaned and cleared. 
Now we go into the hypotympanum. We see the jugular ball. If it's a high jugular ball, it can be all the way to the cochlea. If it's a low jugular ball, you may not find it. We find the carotid here, nice of the carotid artery. We drill all the mucosa, the pericarotid cells, and hypotympanic cells. This is the station two. We come anteriorly, and we drill away the calcitoma into the epitympanum. Now, taking away the calcitoma from the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, being aware that the labyrinthine segment is just immediately to it, so gentle dissection, find, <clears throat> follow that calcitoma. Round window area, so if you need to make at the end, now the hearing is gone here, but if you could preserve the area, you could place very nicely an FMT onto the round window, you have a perfect view. You still have to continue through the labyrinth. With more cholecytoma, you see your other part of the cholecytoma coming up here. Going through the labyrinth, we know the facial nerve, the tympanic segment, that's the segment of the facial nerve. Now we can take out all the colocytoma from this area. Under vision, under good view. So now you see the colocytoma is out. So segment, sigmoid sinus. Facial nerve in the massive segment, tympanic segment, geniculo ganglion. This was the nerve of the colocytoma and the towards the Peter's apex, the cochlea here, round window, hypotympanic cells, carotid artery, and now we obliterate the station two. We first coagulate the mucosa. If it's a wide isthmus, I place some soft tissue. If it's a narrow isthmus, you can just rotate the tensor tendon. Here is the cochlear form process. The tensor is cut. So the tensor tendon can be brought from its semi-canal of the tensor into the isthmus of the station tube. It's like a pedicled flap. And then bone wax keeps the tensor tendon in the lumen of the station tube. <laughs> Here, bone wax, and you need a larger piece of bone wax and cotton, otherwise the bone wax will flip away. So we place a larger piece of cotton than the bone wax. The nurses have to know that. And then you push it not into the carotid artery, but it's parallel to the carotid artery. And then you have a tight ceiling here. And now you have a clear so total vitrosectomy with partial labyrinthectomy. You will fill that cavity with abdominal fat, and we've already raised the temporalis muscle, and we will bring the muscle over that cavity. That harvest thing, what is the major complication of that surgery? It's the hematoma where you take the fat. <laughs> <laughs> it happened to me, so um, it was really a surgery without complication that the ear aware that you may have at night a bleeder from harvesting. So this was the overview on the subtotal pinterosectomy, and I'm very happy to uh, get any questions, remarks, comments <laughs> from your part. Excellent. Very good.